This is the first video in a multi-part series where we're going to talk about best practices with logging, and we're going to demonstrate it via Spring Boot. First of all, why log? We want to log because we want to have an understanding of production issues that might have gone wrong in the past. This is one of those things that you don't always get in school. A lot of times you learn how to write good programs, but the reality is, in our industry, we spend a lot of time hunting down defects and looking at problems in production. And being good and efficient at doing that is a skill that's very highly valued, probably even more highly valued than being able to write code. So we want to make sure that we're using logging because logging gives us the breadcrumbs that we need to go back and investigate an issue. So some best practices. Number one, use logging levels appropriately. When you're logging, you can log things at different levels, from trace to debug to info to warn, all the way up to error, and you can even define some custom logging levels. It's important that you're logging at the right level. In other words, something that's a common occurrence that's normal and expected should not be logged as an error, where an error should not be logged as info, because we'll use those severity levels to help us sift through logs and find out what's actually important and what might have caused an issue. Now, sifting through logs is an important skill. An error will not be logged very frequently, hopefully, in your application, but a trace and a debug might be very verbose. So you hear about a needle in a haystack, you might be looking through a huge log file just to look for a couple of errors. You can do that, but another approach is to have a general log file that logs everything, and then a more specific log file that only logs what is severe. That can help you to narrow down an issue without having to search through a humongous set of files. If you have a try-catch block or an exception, you should always have a log statement in there, even if you don't think so, even if you don't think you need it. An exception could occur at any time, and you want to be able to see where this exception has occurred. An empty catch block without a log message is throwing away some very important information. A final thought is that if we do have an exception, we don't want to display that exception to the user as it is. So if we have something like a null pointer exception, you don't want to have a message box that says, null point or exception, because number one, the user doesn't understand what that means, and that's just confusing and intimidating. Number two, maybe the user does know what it means, because maybe you have a user who's trying to hack into your system and is trying to figure out as much as he or she can about your system, and the more exception logging you give that user, uh, the more information you're arming that user with. So the log levels that I mentioned earlier, error, warn, info, debug, and trace, these are some common log levels that we'll have, along with log levels that you can define yourself. So error, you should only use that if an error actually occurred, something like a catch block. Warn is something that isn't necessarily an error, but just doesn't smell right. Something like getting zero results from a search might be a warn. Info is kind of an everyday occurrence, something like, okay, this user has logged in, we might log that at info. Debug, we're getting to a much more granular level here because this is something we're typically only going to turn on when we're in development mode and we want to look at steps through our application. That is one nice thing about logging is that we can filter by these levels. So we can say only show me info and greater, which is common in production. But in development mode, we might say show me everything, which would be trace all the way up to error. So trace is a very fine grain level uh, where you're essentially looking at entry and exit points. So in Spring Boot logging, it gives us some logging capabilities by default with a dependency called Spring-JCL. The nice thing is this is already included with some other dependencies, including Spring Boot Starter Web or Spring Boot Starter Logging. In our application, we're using Spring Boot Starter Web, so we don't need to import anything extra to get our logging. Now, by default, we can use these logs, but they will log to the console. So when you start a Spring Boot application in Eclipse, you'll see this information come up in the console tab that you're probably familiar with by this point. You might want to log to a separate file or multiple files, and that's where we're going to need to have a configuration file. To get a logger with Spring Boot, we simply say logger log equals logger factory get logger, and then we have to provide it the class which is producing the logs, because that will appear in the log output if we want it to. Then to actually log something, we'll say log.debug if we want to log it at debug level, log.info, log.error, so on and so forth. So let's take a look at a hands-on example with Spring Boot. We'll start with our controller class, and up at the top of the controller class, I'll declare my logger factory, and then we'll say .get log. <clears throat> 
git logger, uh, this dot git class. Now you see we're going to need to do a little bit of auto importing. Uh, so control shift O will organize our imports for us. Control shift and O. And I had a little bit of trouble with this getting the logging information or getting the imports to work just right when I was doing a demo. So this is one where I think it's a little bit easier if we do an old school manual import. So I'll simply go to the top and say import org.slf4j. And then dot logger factory. And with any luck, that'll take care of our logger. Now, logger factory get dot get logger is going to return a logger. So logger log equals logger factory dot get logger. And you see it's starting to come together a little bit better. Now we still need to import the logger as well. So let's see. Uh, this one, yeah, this, this time it gives us an option. And there we go, a little bit of importing, but nonetheless, we now have a variable called log. And this variable called log is what we can use to do some logging. So let's put a few logs into our application. We'll start with our endpoint start. That seems like an easy one. This would be a good place to do a log.info. So we'll say log. Dot info and notice that we have several options that we can use here several overridden methods so there's one that takes a simple string which is the one we're going to use one that takes a marker one that takes a format one that takes a throwable which would be an exception to keep things simple let's just use the very first one and say uh, user we'll put this in quotes because it's a string so user has entered the start endpoint something like that okay now let's scroll down a little bit and look at some other work that we've done in this controller class. We have the search plants application. Now we know there's a major consideration on a catch block. One of the things that we want to do is we want to log the information. And sometimes it's interesting. Sometimes I think logging statements can serve as good substitutes for comments because you get an idea of why you ended up in this catch block. Now for a log, we will typically put that into a text file that we'll see under the covers that the user won't necessarily see. So if we're just logging to a text file that's only has we have permission to access, then we can put some details in there. So here we'll say log dot error and we're going to use the we're going to use uh, the message and throwable signature on this one. So we'll say uh, error happened or occurred in search plants endpoint. And then we'll terminate uh, the, whoops, one moment. Why? Uh, so put our quote there, put it in the right place this time, and then comma, and then we'll simply uh, put E is the next argument. So E is the exception object that's getting thrown into this catch block. Okay, on the other hand, remember I said a warn is something that we'll typically use if something just doesn't feel right, but it's not necessarily an error. So up in the try part, remember how the try works. Line 112 is going to execute. If something goes wrong there, it's going to skip line 113 and jump right to the catch block. But if everything goes right, it's going to execute line 113 and skip the catch block. So you can think of the try catch kind of like an if test. So after line 113, let's say log. Well, actually, let's do this. Let's say if plants dot length or size rather equal equal zero so we receive no plants uh, then what we'll say is log dot warn and then we'll say message received zero results for search string and then do a little string concatenation here search term now since we put this log statement here why don't we go ahead and put maybe a debug statement up above and uh, we'll put that at the very top and say, okay, uh, we're entering the search plans method. So log dot debug, entering search plans. And then maybe when we're about to return, we'll say log dot debug and then say exiting search plans. Now this, you see, was very easy to do because Spring Boot comes with this logger built in. We simply need to import it and then we need to add our uh, logging statements. One caveat is it's only going to log this to the console. 
Uh, so the console could be the interactive console that we look at in Eclipse. It could also be system.out or system.ir, depending on how we're set up. But it kind of dumps it into one place. In a future video, we're going to see how we can tailor this to go to different places based on the logging level. Nonetheless, in this video, let's, let's go ahead and restart. And let's keep an eye on this console. When I talk about the console in our application, it's this console tab right here in Eclipse. So let me go ahead and restart it. Just one moment, please. It terminated when I made that change. And looks like we're looking pretty good. So take a mental screen capture of what you see in the console right now. As a matter of fact, I'll expand it up a little bit. And what you'll see is a date, and then you'll see the word info, and then uh, something in a square bracket here, which represents a thread, and then a message that follows. But kind of just take a notice of what you see here. You see several infos and request mapper handling, so on and so forth. Just grab a couple nuggets from that. Let's go back now to our application, and let's go to the start endpoint. I go to the start endpoint, point, and I return to our console. And take a look here. We have plant places controller user has entered the start endpoint. Do you remember that? That's one of the logging messages that we put, one of the very first logging messages that we had here on that start endpoint. Let's just go back and refresh ourselves here. So the start endpoint, when we get it with the uh, get HTTP method, it logs to info level, user has entered the start endpoint. Okay, let's keep going with this and let's try to see if our plant results endpoints are going to hit now as well. So we have a log debug, a log warn, and a log error, and then another log debug. So let's go back and search for something. We'll search for maybe Redbud. We'll search for Red. And I hit search, and we get some results back, and these are live data results. We run back to our console, and we click, and what do we see? A uh, user has entered the start endpoint. We see that one. Any others? Um, Nothing just yet, but now this is kind of interesting because we're not seeing any logging statements. Now, why is that? Well, notice the only log statements that would hit so far is this log debug that starts our method, and the log debug that ends our method. Those aren't going to show because this console by default only shows info and greater. It doesn't show debug. If we want to show debug, we have to go in and do some configuration, which we'll look at in our next video. Now, what about the log error? Well, that didn't fire because everything executed properly. What about the log warn? Well, that didn't fire because we actually did get results. But let me try this one more time. And instead of searching on red, I'm just going to search on gibberish, which should not return any results. And I hit search. No results. And now we go back and let's take a look at our logger and take a look at this very last line. Do you see warn here? Now let's scroll to the right. We see plant places controller received zero results for search string and then the gibberish that I typed in earlier. So you see those logging levels are very important because they determine what goes into our console, what goes into our logs, and it also makes it really easy to scan our logs and look for something that stands out. In other words, if I scroll up and down here, you see several things that are info, but then this warn really sticks out down here because it's not an info. So if a customer calls me and says, I can't use your app, I can go through and I can look and I can find something like a warn or an error, and then I can look at the message that results and say, okay, I understand. Uh, you just put in gibberish data, or maybe you capitalized something that should have been capitalized, or maybe you misspelled something like Circus Canadensis. So those warn levels will really stick out. So that's a look at an overview of logging and a quick example of logging in Spring Boot. These principles apply to just about anything, even if it's not Spring Boot. Spring Boot just happens to be an easy way to demonstrate. So in our next video, we're going to see how to configure Spring Boot logging, how to set up some logging configuration files, and what all the symbols mean in the logging configuration file. I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.